In the darkest hours of the Second World War, when Nazi Germany seemed unstoppable, a small, secretive group of individuals hidden deep in the English countryside became one of the Allies' most powerful weapons. They weren't soldiers. They didn't wield guns or drive tanks. Their weapon was the mind. Their battleground was paper, wires, and cryptic signals. Bletchley Park was not just a house, it was the nerve center of the greatest code-breaking operation in modern history. And the people who worked there changed the course of the war, and perhaps the course of the entire 20th century, without ever firing a single shot. Their story was hidden for decades, buried under the strict silence of the Official Secrets Act. But now, the world can finally hear the truth, it all began with Enigma. The Germans believed their Enigma machine was unbreakable. Every military message they sent was encrypted with it. Each day, the settings changed, resulting in over 150 quintillion possible combinations. To the Germans, it was invincible. To the Allies, it was a wall that needed to be torn down brick by digital brick. The task of breaking Enigma was assigned to an unlikely team, a handful of mathematicians, linguists, chess champions, and eccentric geniuses, many of whom had never seen war. Among them was a young, quiet man named Alan Turing. He was awkward in conversation, but behind his eyes was a machine-like mind that saw the world in equations and patterns. Turing understood that brute force alone couldn't break Enigma. It would take ingenuity, automation, and a new kind of thinking, before the war, Bletchley Park had been a quiet Victorian mansion. But as war loomed, it was converted into a hive of activity. Recruits arrived in secrecy, sworn to silence. Many were recruited straight from universities like Cambridge and Oxford. Others were selected for their skills in crosswords and puzzles. The British government even ran secret crossword competitions in newspapers to identify potential cryptanalysts. By late 1939, the estate buzzed with tension and urgency. Every intercepted message, every crackle of Morse code, could mean life or death. The German U-boats were sinking Allied ships with terrifying efficiency. Convoys carrying food, weapons, and troops were vanishing into the Atlantic depths. The only way to stop them was to know where they were, and to know that, the Allies had to break the Enigma code, the breakthrough didn't happen all at once. It came in pieces, like assembling a puzzle in the dark. Turing realized that certain German messages often contained predictable phrases. Weather reports, standard openings, even repeated names. These known patterns, known as cribs, could be used to reverse engineer the settings of the Enigma machine. But doing this by hand took days, and by then, the messages were useless. Turing needed speed. He imagined a machine, a thinking machine, that could test thousands of Enigma settings in a single minute. With support from British intelligence and the Polish codebreakers who had made earlier strides against Enigma, Turing designed the bomb. It was massive, noisy, and mechanical, but it worked. Day and night, it whirred and clattered, analyzing code permutations, searching for the needle of meaning in a haystack of noise. But Turing wasn't working alone. Joan Clark, one of the few female cryptanalysts, played a critical role in Enigma decryption. She was brilliant and fast, able to spot patterns others missed. Like Turing, she kept her emotions buried under layers of logic and discipline. Their friendship was deep and complex. For a time, they were even engaged. But Turing eventually confided in her about his homosexuality, a dangerous admission in an era where such an identity was criminalized. Joan accepted him, respected him, and remained a loyal friend and collaborator. Their story is a quiet testament to the depth of human connection that can flourish even in the most secretive of circumstances, as the war intensified, Bletchley Park grew. Huts sprang up across the estate. Each one was dedicated to a different enemy cipher system. Hut 6 worked on Army and Air Force codes. Hut 8, led by Turing, focused on the Navy's more complex Enigma variants. The team worked in shifts around the clock. Codebreakers went blind with fatigue, their fingers stained with ink and paper cuts. Messages arrived by the minute. 
Sometimes, they would decrypt a message about an upcoming bombing raid, knowing that they couldn't act on it without revealing they had broken the code. The moral burden was immense. Each decision weighed heavily. Save one convoy or keep the secret safe for the greater war effort, their success wasn't just technical, it was strategic. Once Bletchley began reading Enigma messages in real time, the tide of war began to shift. Convoys were rerouted. Ambushes were avoided. The Germans never suspected their secret language had been compromised. One of Bletchley's greatest triumphs came before D-Day. The Allies used fake radio traffic, phony divisions, and double agents to convince Hitler that the invasion would happen at Calais, not Normandy. Bletchley provided the proof that the Germans had bought the deception. Without Bletchley's insight, the Normandy landings could have ended in catastrophe, and yet, for all their brilliance, the people of Bletchley were ghosts in their own story. They signed pledges of silence, forbidden from ever discussing their work. Many died without their families knowing the impact they had made. Alan Turing, the mind that cracked the uncrackable, was prosecuted in 1952 for being gay. He was chemically castrated and died two years later in what was officially deemed suicide. Only decades later would the British government apologize. In 2013, Queen Elizabeth II granted him a posthumous pardon. The legacy of Bletchley Park is not just in the messages they broke or the lives they saved. It is a lesson in how human intellect, when combined with courage, collaboration, and sacrifice, can shape the world, behind every decrypted message was a sleepless night. Behind every decoded pattern, a hundred discarded theories. The noise, the stress, the secrecy, none of it stopped them. They drank weak tea and smoked cigarettes by the dozen, scratching formulas on blackboards while bombs fell in distant cities. These weren't superheroes. They were ordinary people doing the extraordinary. Historians estimate that their work shortened the war by at least two years. Millions of lives may have been saved. But their names went unrecognized for generations. Only now, in the light of declassified archives and fading memories, do we begin to grasp the scale of their achievement, even the tools they created, the machines, the methods, the very logic that underpinned their work, would go on to shape the world in ways they never imagined. Alan Turing's theoretical work on algorithms and computing machines laid the groundwork for modern computer science. The bomb wasn't just a code-breaking tool, it was a prototype for the digital future. The cold, mechanical ticking that once signaled the decryption of enemy secrets was the first heartbeat of the information age. But at the time, these were simply wartime necessities. Created under pressure, stress, and urgency. No one at Bletchley Park could have known they were building the foundation for a technological revolution. Their eyes were focused not on the future, but on the next message, the next code, the next life that might be saved if only they worked fast enough. Among the many unsung heroes was Bill Tutte, a mathematician who broke the Lorenz cipher, used by Hitler himself to communicate with his top generals. Unlike Enigma, Lorenz was even more complex, using a system of 12 wheels and thousands of combinations. Tutte had never even seen the Lorenz machine, yet he reconstructed its internal wiring from intercepted messages and pure logic. His work was described as one of the greatest intellectual feats of the war. Alongside him, Tommy Flowers, an engineer at the post office research station, designed Colossus, the world's first programmable electronic digital computer. It processed data faster than anything else in existence. It was top secret for decades. But today, its DNA is in every smartphone, every laptop, every digital system humanity uses daily. These weren't just victories against tyranny, they were blueprints for the future, and then there were the thousands of women who made Bletchley work. Nearly three quarters of the staff were women, most of them in their twenties, many recruited from the Women's Royal Naval Service or through classified letters sent to promising university students. They worked tirelessly, often on repetitive and exhausting tasks, managing intercepts, operating machines, translating messages, cross-referencing logs, all under the same oath of silence. Despite their contributions, many of them went unrecognized for decades. 
They return to civilian life with their stories locked away inside them, as if their role in one of the greatest intelligence operations in history had never happened. Only in recent years have their voices begun to surface, through memoirs, interviews, and official acknowledgments, the story of Bletchley Park is a story of contradictions. It was a place of innovation born from tradition. It was a hive of progressive thinking in an age of rigid norms. It was where mathematical logic met human intuition, and where cold machines were operated by warm, exhausted hands. The workers at Bletchley were under constant pressure, knowing that every mistake could mean death for soldiers, sailors, civilians. Yet they carried on. Without reward. Without fame. With no certainty that their work would even make a difference. They did it because it had to be done. Because in a world engulfed in darkness, they had the tools to light a candle, even if no one would see the flame for years, in the post-war years, as the Cold War began to settle over Europe, Bletchley Park fell into obscurity. Its buildings stood silent, decaying, their walls still echoing the secrets once whispered within. Many of the machines were dismantled. Documents were destroyed. The people who had once saved nations became teachers. Clerks, scientists, and housewives, returning to ordinary lives after doing something extraordinary. The silence endured. Not just because of official orders, but because of the culture of quiet pride they had developed. For decades, the public remained unaware of just how close the world had come to losing the war, and how a small group of individuals had helped change the outcome, it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that the first pieces of the Bletchley puzzle began to surface. Memoirs trickled out. Historians began asking questions. Files were declassified, revealing the vast scale of the operation. Slowly, the narrative changed. What had once been a forgotten footnote in military history became a central chapter in the story of World War II. Films, books, documentaries, they all began to piece together what really happened behind the iron gates and hedgerows of Bletchley Park. Alan Turing's name became synonymous with genius and tragedy. His face appeared on currency. His work became the subject of films and lectures. But even these tributes often simplified the reality. Turing was not alone. He was one brilliant mind among hundreds, all working toward a shared, secret purpose. Today, Bletchley Park stands restored, a museum and memorial to the quiet warriors of signal intelligence. The halls are lined with replicas of the bomb, with charts and intercepted messages, with the voices of those who were once sworn to silence. Schoolchildren walk through the same narrow corridors where once the fate of nations was calculated in chalk and ink. Veterans return, their eyes misty, their memories sharp. They tell stories of cold mornings, endless hours, missed meals, and sudden breakthroughs. Of the moment a code broke open like a lock finally clicking after weeks of jiggling with the right key. Of the joy not of glory, but of service. Of knowing that their work had meant something. Even if no one else knew, there's a reason the story of Bletchley Park still resonates. It reminds us that history is not always made by those on the front lines. Sometimes, it's shaped in shadows, by those working in silence, in rooms filled with chalk dust and whispers. It's a story of intellect over brute force, of teamwork over ego, of purpose over recognition. In a world where conflict continues, where the value of information remains paramount, the lessons of Bletchley endure. That the right minds, given the right tools and the freedom to think, can achieve miracles. That truth, even when encrypted, can be revealed. That even in the darkest of times, light can be found, one message at a time. And perhaps, most poignantly, it teaches us that the human spirit, curious, determined, collaborative, can outweep even the most complex of machines. The enigma was supposed to be perfect. Impenetrable. But it wasn't. Not because of a flaw in its wiring, but because of the strength of those who refused to give up, who saw every failed attempt as another step forward. Who knew that silence was sometimes the greatest form of sacrifice. They didn't break enigma with one brilliant move. They broke it with thousands of quiet, persistent acts. One pencil mark at a time. 
one idea tested again and again. One person refusing to stop trying, they didn't wear uniforms. They didn't march in parades. But they were soldiers in their own right. And because of them, because of the quiet work done in the wooden huts of Bletchley Park, millions survived. Empires didn't fall. Tyranny didn't win. Because somewhere, behind locked doors and guarded fences, the codebreakers were listening. Thinking. Solving. And ultimately, prevailing.